Software is eating the world, is a great quote from the venture capitalist uh, Mark Andreessen. I love it because in five short words, he captures the whole sweep, the scope, and the speed that technology is changing at, and uh, I think we're all challenged by it every day. Um, in fact, I like it so much, I'm going to appropriate it under fair use or whatever today, um, because I think there's actually something far more profound happening. Um, in, I think the big thing that is happening right now is that genomics is eating the world. This is me in uh, 1965. I am um, helping my dad fix the family car. Uh, we grew up in Sydney, Australia, in the northern suburbs. They were kind of being carved out of the, the Australian bush back then. Um, I always loved to tinker. So from you know, that point, I was pulling things apart, watches, everything, washing machines. Eventually ended up um, working on televisions and bigger and more complicated things. Um, one of the best jobs I ever had was repairing elevators, which I love. That is a great job if you ever had the chance. Um, and I went on to get a PhD in electrical engineering. Um, ended up working at probably what was at the time the, the Tinkerer's Paradise, which was Bell Labs in New Jersey for a number of years. And ended up working on silicon chips that uh, were for, uh, building digital cameras and fingerprint sensors, uh, which you find in uh, cell phones, smartphones today. Uh, I grew up with my sister Ingrid. Uh, she loved horses just the way that uh, I loved tinkering. Um, unfortunately, about a year after this picture was taken, she died uh, of a brain tumor. And my family never recovered, my parents in particular. It was very, very difficult, I think, losing a child. And it obviously always stuck with me. And as I went through my career, I always found myself searching for something, it's a cliche, but searching for something more. Uh, in particular, I was interested in medicine and biology, but I had no aptitude for those things. I was an electrical engineer. Fortunately, in 2007, I got to meet um, Professor David Baltimore at Caltech, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in about 1975. And he and I started a um, molecular diagnostics company. And ever since I did that, which was a wonderful experience, ever since I did that, I've been working on the sort of the intersection of computers and biology, which is an absolutely fascinating area I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Staying with the theme of 1965, 50 years uh, ago, um, this is what an operating theater looked like. This is what it looks like in 2015. It really hasn't changed much at all, and to some extent epitomizes the problem we face in healthcare, which is it's incredibly skill and labor and time intensive. It's very, very difficult to do anything with that, and we haven't changed it very much over the years. Uh, this is a car that was hot in 1965. The Citroen DX moved five people at around 70, 80 miles an hour along a, uh, a freeway, had four wheels. Uh, obviously, this is a car that's hot this year. The Tesla Model S moves five people at 70 or 80 miles an hour along a freeway. Um, the difference is uh, the Tesla weighs 2,000 pounds more, and it has over 100 million lines of software in it. But it hasn't changed the basic way the car can do its job of moving from A to B. When I was a kid, um, I love photography, and when I was a kid, to take photographs, you'd um, get a little Instamatic camera, you'd put a cartridge in it, which had film in it, you'd take your 12 pictures, probably over about a month, You'd mail off the little cartridge and the, to the lab. The lab would develop the cartridge and would send these photos back again. And if you wanted to share, you opened the folder and you shared the photos, right? <laughs> and um, photography had been that way for 150 years. It's incredibly ancient, you know, just using chemicals and, and, and um, film and pieces of paper. And then, of course, what came along um, were these digital image sensors, which allow us to convert directly from an image into digital data. And then it turned out we have all these amazing screens that we can display the photographs on, and then people's imaginations run amok, right? And so we end up with um, Instagram, uh, just things that were unimaginable even, in, even a couple of years ago. So, oh, I think we missed a slide. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm going to make some stuff up. Uh, <laughs> um, the important thing is data scales and stuff doesn't, right? So data, once we've got something in the form of data, we're very good at processing and handling it and accelerating it. But if we're in the stuff or in the material world, it's really hard for us to do things with it. And the irony in the case of healthcare about that is we are actually digital beings. The DNA down in our microbiology is just streams of symbols, streams of data. Just like in a computer, we could represent streams of symbols, data, maybe on a magnetic tape. It's exactly the same thing. And that is ironic because, of course, healthcare doesn't 
get to benefit from that at all. So one way to think about that is that DNA is just code. It's just programming code that happens to be a program for designing a human being. And in fact, here's an example of a piece of code. This is in a language Fortran, which I hope no one in this room has had to see in their lives. Uh, it just happens that this is a particularly famous piece of 1962 code of um, Fortran, uh, in that someone doing the card punch made a mistake, and they swapped a period for a comma. Unfortunately, it was in the navigation system for a uh, rocket, and that rocket exploded uh, on launch. Now, fortunately, there was nobody in the rocket. It was unmanned. But it, it reminds one of the, the, you can have this incredible fragility in the data and it can have a huge impact at the other end in the real world. This is a very short sequence out of the human genome, um, and most people have exactly this sequence in, in that particular gene. Some people end up with a G instead of an A. Unfortunately for them, that gives them a major predisposition for gastric cancer, which is obviously unfortunate. So I think the, the message from that is, okay, if DNA is just data, cancer is just a bug in your DNA. And I know that's a gross oversimplification, but think about cancer this way. If you think of cancer as a tumor, then you start working on it by doing things like surgery or chemotherapy, right, by poisoning it. But if you start to think about it in the, as an error in the DNA, you start to think of it as a data processing problem. And that's the transition we're going through right now. The thing is, traditionally, we haven't had any way of converting from the DNA to the data. And that's what uh, gene sequences do. Take a blood sample um, or a urine sample or a saliva sample. It goes through the machine and it generates a data file, just ATCs and Gs, bits. Um, that can be the 23 uh, chromosomes of our entire human genome. So again, the plan for a whole human being. So the way to think about these machines is that sequences uh, translate biology into data. And we are really, really good at processing data. I would argue it's become the core competence of our civilization. So it's kind of interesting. Now we start to think about how we can bridge the gap between this digital kind of nanoscale world and the, the healthcare scale world, which is much bigger. And fortunately, in terms of data, so when you get all the files off a DNA sequencer for a person, it's about uh, 10,000 times more data than a typical photograph, right? So it's a big data problem. But we've gotten very good at processing data. I think Google is the canonical example of that. If I want to know a fact, I can type it into Google and it's going to tell me all the information basically that exists on the whole planet with regard to that fact. So we're very good at needle in a haystack problems. So I'm going to give you two examples of how the combination of a sequencer combined with kind of needle in a haystack data processing is rapidly changing healthcare. This uh, rather gruesome, I don't know if you can see it, a uh, rather gruesome cross-section um, is showing a process or procedure called amniocentesis. So when you want to test the genetic health of a fetus, um, the doctor inserts a very long needle through the mother's uh, stomach, in through the uterine lining, down into the amniotic sac, and using an ultrasound kind of pokes around, puts the end of the needle right next to the fetus, and takes a little bit of the amniotic fluid, and that's sent off for testing. This is uh, very traumatic. Uh, my wife went through it, uh, sitting next to her. It was much more traumatic for me than her, but it was still very traumatic. <laughs> and um, uh, people have been doing it for a long time. And I would say it's, it's in the category of what will one day look quite medieval. Now, what happened um, as sequences started to come online is uh, some very bright people had a different way of doing this. They said, hey, if I take a small blood sample from the mother's arm, I'm going to see mainly the mother's DNA in that sample, but I also see a little bit of the fetal DNA mixed in with it. So if we dump that into a computer, do the needle in the haystack thing, and pull the fetal DNA in, I can test the fetal um, genetic health that way. And so this test was introduced probably only about 18 months ago, and we think it's the fastest ever adoption of a diagnostic test. Because you have the choice of the six-inch needle into the stomach or the little needle into the arm, you will always take uh, the little needle into the arm. Uh, now, something I, as, as someone over 50, uh, actually do have first-hand example of, another medieval um, procedure, is the colonoscopy, which when you're over 50, you have to be screened um, for colon cancer. So it's 24 hours of drinking this goop that cleans out your GI tract, and of course you can't eat, and you're in the bathroom all the time. Then you go in, they give you a general anesthetic, they snake a camera right up inside you, up your colon, and they look for little polyps to decide if you might have cancer. Now, it turns out, I guess this is an amazing coincidence. I haven't thought it through enough. But the testing that happened um, on the left had a huge impact on what's happening on the right. And that's because as we did more and more testing of those moms and went from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million, 
we started to see some samples that had the mum's DNA, had the fetal DNA, and had some alien DNA in it. And it turned out that alien DNA was cancer, that some of those mothers being tested actually had cancer at the same time and didn't know about it. So now um, there's increasing confidence that what's going to happen is we'll take screening tests like colonoscopy and mammograms, put them aside, and actually you'll be able to have an annual blood test. And that blood test will look for all the small signs of mutations in your DNA that may be eventually leading to cancer. So A, that's a lot less comfortable, and it's a lot more comfortable. It's a lot more thorough. Um, and also it has the potential to discover the cancer at a much earlier stage. And as I'm sure you know, if you ca capture cancer at an earlier stage, uh, you have a much higher chance of curing it. And this is just the start, right? The one on the left is actually happening. The one on the right is a little out in the future. There's a lot of other activity in a lot of other fields. But the theme is, hey, we can take medicine and move it out of the kind of macro scale stuff world and move it into the data world where we tap directly into the DNA and the data underlying the DNA. So my thesis um, is that, as I said, genomics is eating the world. Now, we know software has already eaten the world, right? Uh, you know, billions of users or a billion users for Facebook, um, billions of users for Google. But where are the signs that genomics can do that? Because everything I've said here is, you know, hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, right? It's not free like software. Now, the interesting thing about software is the reason it's so inexpensive is it makes use of the most advanced manufacturing uh, process known to humankind, which is the silicon chip. We do some molecular engineering on the silicon. We can then build billions of transistors on a single chip, all working together and all reliable for a few dollars. We can put them in together, and we have something like an iPhone, kind of a miraculous futuristic device. And that's kind of the pinnacle of our manufacturing ability right now. Of course, for billions of years, nature's been evolving its own, actually much better manufacturing ability, right? This is the, uh, and imperfect as it is, this is the end result of that uh, manufacturing capability. It happens at the molecular level, cells get put together, cells get functionalized, and they become uh, amazing structures like the human eye or the human brain. But the intriguing thing in my mind about sequences is they're actually uh, the result of both of those technologies. We use an extraordinary amount of microbiology to make the sequence of work. We actually use the properties of DNA to zip it and unzip it and split it, um, all sorts of extraordinary acrobatics at the molecular level. But at the same time, we use silicon chips to do the observation of what's going on. So what happens is as these technologies both evolve, the uh, sequences benefit from it. And that's had an amazing result over the last couple of years. So from 2007 to 2014, Moore's law improved chips by 10. So one way to think about that is chips became 10 times cheaper. In that same period of time, genomes became 10,000 times cheaper because the machines benefit both from Moore's law and from microbiology. The end result of that is, as I think you'll see in this movie, which is three years of sequencing across the world, kind of sped up into about a minute, Sequence actually is kind of starting to eat the world. It is actually gradually moving across the world as it becomes less and less expensive. I like to think about that in a historical context, which is back in the 19th century, the technology to have was ships. And if you had ships, you could have a great navy. If you had a navy, you could control the trading routes. And that meant that basically all the trade ran through where you lived. And that usually ended up with somewhere like London or Amsterdam because they had the best ships. And so wealth and the wealth of nations was created at that point. In last century, that was the financial markets. If you had all the skills and all the technology to build a stock exchange, to be able to do low-cost financial transactions, it was like a, a giant black hole. It started to come through your place. And so we ended up with New York and London and Tokyo as having the vast bulk of the world's financial transactions. And those cities and those countries captured that wealth. What we're seeing now is nations like China and the United States um, and the United Kingdom starting to build these armadas of sequences because when you think about the data that they're generating, it's um, not trade, it's not money, it's health, right? It's the cure for diseases like cancer. It's the, maybe, the answer to longevity. How do we make people live longer? So there's potentially huge value in the data that's being collected um, by these projects. So I'm sure I sound like someone that's um, you know, completely overwhelmed, the zeal of the newly uh, converted, if you will. Uh, but I have to say, I'm confident that genomics is the most interesting and impactful uh, sphere of human activity that's happening in the world right now. 
And I'm sure there are uh, people uh, here in search of inspiration around careers and graduate school and so on. I would highly recommend you look at genomics. It's not just an area of activity for doctors and scientists. It also rep represents all sorts of fascinating legal and ethical challenges, uh, psychology, and business. It's really a, an extraordinary, extraordinary place. And uh, I've had a wonderful experience with it. So now I'm, uh, you know, 50 years on. Um, I myself have a daughter, also named Ingrid, after my uh, sister. Uh, she's off to college uh, coming up uh, this summer. Very proud of her. She's in the wings uh, this evening. And, you know, my fondest hope and my belief is increasingly that by the time she is my age, um, when a family finds out about cancer, it won't be a crisis anymore. Uh, it's just going to be a nuisance. And I love that idea. Thank you. <laughs>